Adventure in Half-Ass Productions and we've got a special treat for you today. We're up here at the Metropolitan Museum. And we're gonna try to get in and get some pictures of this show. Balthus. Cats and girls. Well, I got a late start this morning and uh, it was about an hour fighting my way through the uh, maybe the worst traffic in the Western Hemisphere, but I made it. I arrived late, so we just got the last part of the remarks, and uh, I'm only going to have about 45 minutes, so I'm going to make a uh, kind of a cursory run through, and uh, I probably won't get a chance to mention all the titles. Well, this is actually kind of a, a narrow selection of his work, and they're saying that it's all work that was painted in France. Uh, this is Teresa, 1936. Well, I guess was an 11-year-old girl when he originally met her. Well, this is one of the very famous paintings. It's also Teresa. So, I believe this is only from maybe the mid-30s to mid-50s. This is titled King of Cats 1935 and I guess this is appropriate because the title of the show is Cats and Girls. Now I'll just uh, read a little bit from his wiki page. Balthasar Kulzinski, born 1908 and uh, was a child protege. It's called Portrait of Sheila Pickering, Princess of Cats. Well, I guess for a period of time that uh, Balthus gave up his creative painting and was only working as a, a commissioned portrait artist. And uh, after a few years of that, I get pretty tired. I, I like her forehead. And uh, as a young child, he was actually, his family were friends with uh, <laughs> Rainer Maria Roca, and he was sponsored by and knew people like Henri Matisse, Henri Gide, Jean Cocteau. It's called Teresa on a Bench Seat. You know, he's always got these uh, adolescent girls posed in very provocative uh, positions. It's Theresa 1938, oil on cardboard. Well, when I started going to the Art Students League, I guess 1979, the Pierre Matisse Gallery was still in operation at the Fuller Building, I think it's 41 East 57th Street. This is also Theresa 1939. This is maybe one of his greatest pieces from this period. Teresa Dreaming, 1938. Anyway, I remember maybe 1979 going and seeing a show of Altus's latest paintings. And, uh, then a few years later they actually had the major retrospective of his work here at the Met. Uh, 
is really a great example of his kind of typical narrative pieces. And you can see where some of these figures are definitely inspired by some of the classic Italians like uh, Uccello and uh, Frau Angelico. But uh, compositionally, and look at this you know, curvy form here in the leg of the piano, and it's echoed in the back of this chair. It's kind of echoed in the back of that figure as well. So this will be interesting. We'll take a look at this version. Salon 2. And uh, we'll compare it to this version. Salon 1. I guess that he often repeated his themes if he found something that was good. Let's see his little pencil drawing under there. Oh, and he took out the kitty cat. It's a beautiful little study for the golden days. It's the golden days in 1944 to 46. And uh, among the young painters that I knew, uh, Balthus was almost a uh, kind of a secret cult figure. And uh, I think he kind of represented uh, an academic figuration that had sort of strayed into kind of surrealism or some kind of exotic narrative which made it modern somehow. It's titled Sleeping Girl 1943. And also the fact that he consciously had uh, studied and uh, was influenced by the masters, especially Italian primitives, I think made him even more attractive. Still life with figure. The still life is beautiful, and uh, that knife and the bread is great. Well, he was uh, already known as an artist when he was in his teens, and we're going to try to get in and see some ink drawings that he did when he was 11. Kind of titled the card player. Oh, this looks like somebody that escaped from a Piero della Francesca painting. This as well. And I like the, uh, kind of the split pattern on the blouse. Green versus red. Of uh, grayish green flesh tones makes me think of Montagna. This is Salon 3, and uh, they say that this is when Balthus returned to Paris in 1946 after the war with his wife and two children. But I think one of the things a lot of painters appreciate about Balthus is that, uh, you know, he was so committed to painting and uh, he would kind of obsessively work on these paintings that they started to get a uh, very unusual nubby surface. 
and somehow there's a uh, kind of a matter of, matter of fact quality that uh, kind of makes me think of some Corbet nudes. It's another nice piece, nude with cat, and. Uh, Although they don't have any of his great uh, late pieces that were done in Casein, as we go along, we get a chance to see some of the other pieces that he really uh, builds up quite an extraordinary surface on. This is titled The Room 1947-1948. And uh, it's just beautifully painted. I mean, uh, both of us definitely had a had a feeling for his materials. And uh, standing nude is almost like a an enunciation. This is the week of four Thursdays, 1949. And again, this is another version of a girl with the arched back in the room. There's the cat. Well, this is the uh, salon that they've got the calling the Mitsu drawings. These were done when he was 11. We'll make a quick sweep over them. I guess these were thought to be lost. And I would say that probably each one of these pages is uh, five by four inches. And the actual drawings are probably about three by three inches. I guess Mitsu was a cat that he found. And this kind of uh, establishes his cat theme. Some of the, uh, the figurative elements here make me think of Chagall, but oh, some of it's got very uh, nice abstract layouts. This is a study for of La Méditerranée, and uh, this is a probably about as uh, surrealistic or fantasy-based as he ever gets. And uh, oh God, he's using great heavy weave linen. This is one of his uh, few very coloristic pieces. I think the. Uh, Rainbow is very uh, untypical. This is the uh, fourth salon, and uh, this represents work from 1953 to 1960, when Balthus left Paris to live at the Chateau de Chassé. In Morvan, in France. Uh, this is also a great example of his kind of use of tonal painting and uh, it's also nice that uh, he 
doesn't get carried away with the details. He just sort of does what he needs to do to get the message across and then leaves a lot of this almost uh, unfinished. So you'll have uh, underdrawing coming through, underpainting. It's a lot of overworking. Girl at a Window, 1955. Now, here we start to see the nubby buildup. But I think these are much less uh, kind of psychologically impacted, more of simple figure studies. Oh, this is a beautiful piece. The Moth, 1959 to 1960. And uh, here we can see him starting to build up his surfaces. And now it's covering the entire surface. So he was kind of obsessively going back in and uh, reworking these. And it almost makes me think of a Milton Resnick painting. And his use of uh, kind of compositional vectors and patterning is nice. This is titled The Toilet. And uh, here we can see that he's actually left his gridding in. He was known as a great, great draftsman. And a lot of, I think, the reason that many painters love him is that. Uh, he was great at drawing with paint. And he's got very thin uh, kind of glazes over a, a basic uh, heavy ground of oil paint. There's a lot of crackle in this too. Oh, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is in the Mets permanent collection. Nude in front of a mirror, 1955. And uh, his line is extraordinary. Look at the shape of his hair compared against the shape of her buttocks. and the molding of this fireplace, the mantle. It's great stuff. Well, we'll slide down this last wall. This is titled The Game of Patience, 1954. And uh, again, we've got our cat. But you can see that uh, as Balthus develops his style, the, uh, the figures and the detail become subservient to just the paint handling. And uh, again, I think that uh, beyond his compositions, beyond the kind of erotic uh, narratives, and even beyond just the texture of the paint, there is a quality of his, his use of tone and shade <coughs> that recalls someone like a Mirandi. This is titled Dream. And again, she's got the uh, kind of the gray-green flesh tones. And the one little poppy. 
and the figures have become almost uh, kind of manneristically stylized. We bumped into Duncan Hanna here, and uh, Duncan is a longtime fan and kind of a uh, figure of painter in his own right. Why don't you give us a little appreciation of, of, of Baltus? Well, he's always been um, a master to me. And I love his mix of old world painterliness and Courbet. Yes. Uh, Nobokovian um, narratives, and mystery. How do you think this relates to uh, some of the contemporary? figurative painting that's being done by, by younger artists here in New York? Well, Baltus is so uh, restrained and subtle. I mean, he's just classier than anything happening right now, I'd say. And there's a timelessness, yes. obviously, to these paintings that you don't see in a lot of contemporary art. And he was obviously going for the classical rather than just the uh, spectacular. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's also very much of its time. I mean, it's interesting, the World War II paintings in there, you'd never know the war was happening. Yes. Because it's this hermetic world that he was totally concentrated on, and it's his own world. And in a way, I mean, that's what every artist could hope to do, right. is create their own world. And if Baltus didn't do it, I mean, who did? All right. Thanks, Duncan Hanna. Thank you. Well, that was very nice of Duncan Hanna to uh, give us a little appreciation. We got a couple of more paintings we're going to wrap up with here. This is Girl in White Smock, 1955. And uh, this is nice. He's uh, kind of masked out his forms in the face. And Her white smock is basically just bare canvas. You can see the drips and stings, the underpainting that he's built up there. And then her cheek gets nubby. This is one of the, maybe the last piece in the show. The cup of coffee. 1959-1960 oil on canvas and uh, it's kind of uh, kind of a dichotomy in that uh, in certain ways his use of pattern and even some of the uh, subdued colors kind of recall Matisse but uh, his figures are kind of like Piero della Francesca and then his his paint surface is very kind of obsessive, but modern. This is a beautiful piece. Here again, you can still see that they're just uh, sketchy little paint lines that he's laid in his forms with. This is James Calm reporting on Baltus, Cats and Girls at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Beautiful. Thank you.